Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you in the room who don't know me, uh, my name is Devinder Malhotra. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at St. Charles State University. And it's indeed my distinct uh, pleasure to welcome you all to this very exciting session of uh, our conference. And uh, this conference, uh, in some ways, is new, but in very a short period of time, in the last, I would say, three years, it has acquired a level of stature and it has deepened and enhanced itself in a manner that uh, it's become a major uh, regional and state level event and uh, uh, indeed is getting, uh, started to getting some national attention too. So uh, that bodes both well for both uh, 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 the areas and issues with which uh, faculty and staff involved uh, work, but it also bodes well uh, uh, and, and is a great indicator of the passion and energy and the, uh, and the hard work uh, demonstrated by all the faculty involved uh, in organizing this conference and uh, in working on immigrant issues. And I certainly take a lot of pride in the work and uh, on behalf of the institution and I certainly uh, commend them for their work and uh, uh, we'll try to be uh, as supportive as I possibly can so that this work can increase both in its breadth and scope. Uh, with that, I also recognize you all didn't come to listen to me. I just came here because I want to welcome you all, uh, particularly uh, all the students I see here and all the faculty and staff I see here. Uh, uh, I know you're in for a great, uh, great, great session, an important conversation, as the topic of uh, uh, this lecture suggests. Uh, and uh, at this stage, uh, I will let you uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Steve Fillion, uh, who has been leading all the efforts, uh, not only in the area of research and scholarship, but also in the area of pedagogical experimentation in this area. And uh, uh, it is his brainchild, the conference, which has taken very strong roots. So with that, I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Fillion. Actively engage in a collaborative relationship with the community. 
And what he did in 2007 is he went on an 8,000 mile bike ride around the country to see how immigration is affecting uh, people in the United States, that is, uh, whether immigrants or people who've been here for, you know, uh, well, everybody actually is basically an immigrant in this country, so forth, and Native Americans. Uh, but in any event, he went and did this bike ride, uh, and from that bike ride, engaged in numerous, numerous conversations uh, with immigrants as human beings. And it's another component of our research group, we'd like to um, support the idea that if you really want to understand issues of immigration and, and immigrants, you have to see them as human beings and engage with them as fellow human beings. Um, and so he did that, and I think he did it in a very, a very unique, very, a very unique way. And from that experience, uh, he already uh, put out a wonderful video on that experience, and also um, he's uh, compiled, uh, written a book called "Conversations Across America: The Latinoization of, of, of America." Um, that book is also, as it happens, the title of this talk. And so I would ask you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Lewis Mendoza. I begin by thanking uh, Stephen and the uh, and the St. Cloud State University Faculty Research Group on Immigrant Workers in Minnesota, which I think is again has done a wonderful job in building reputation for hosting this conference the last three years. Uh, what I'm going to do is sort of share a lot of uh, anecdotes and information, as well as the larger, some demographic information, which I think is in historical information, which I believe is important to understand uh, the larger issue when we talk about the, the very heated and vitriolic debates we have around immigration and this issue, and, and our struggles to resolve what that means, because really this has been one, an ongoing issue. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my motivations which go, which obviously precede taking the bike trip and the planning that went into that. But I'll set the context with you, maybe with a little bit of some of video clips, and I'll probably cut that pretty short, but I'll let Chad know when to cut it. But we're going to start there, and then we'll come back to uh, my, my presentation. I'll, it could be a very multimedia one. another tool for our state to use as we work to solve a crisis that we did not create and the federal government has refused to fix. Well, we have 3,000 and uh, we use the policy to go after Debbie parents and uh, hookers that go on and on. Now they are helping our deputies to uh, suppress crime and in the process if we come across any illegal aliens, we don't arrest them, we don't let them go. The Minutemen are, are wearing guns now on the border. A special type of bullet that will penetrate a bulletproof vest. So that when I come across um, illegals that do have bulletproof vests on, um, I'm capable of uh, neutralizing them. In order to understand today's immigration crisis and the controversies surrounding it, it helps. Okay, there's I don't know this, partic this particular version of the video, but there's a beginning piece there that went back to some of the debates, the political debates last, uh, last presidential election. And clearly immigration is still an unsettled issue you know, five years later. And I, uh, it would have been nice to see something that I'm not quite sure would happen. But I nevertheless uh, point that out that it's, it's still impacting, maybe not to the level it was last time, but uh, you know, here we are again five years later and it still becomes a major issue. So let me set the setting for this, this project. In the spring of 2006, um, the U.S. experienced a series of unprecedented immigrant rights marches involving hundreds of thousands of people across the country as they sought to shift the rising tide of anti-immigrant discourse in the media and in the public at large. These marches occurred in response to a highly visible anti-immigrant, anti-Latino discourse that presumably revolves around the core of who we are as an immigrant nation, the cultural, philosophical, and political qualities that define who belongs in the U.S. Between the calls for amnesty, guest worker programs, the border wall, and the repeal of birthright citizenship, a rampant xenophobia tinged and continues to inform debates on immigration as people express their fears that Spanish will supplant English as the national language, that a vast conspiracy is at work in which Mexico is planning to retake the southwestern United States, that new immigrants are dumbing down the nation or stealing jobs, social services, and education without paying taxes, 
to name but a few of the more salient issues. The anxiety of the mainstream population and social conservatives regarding demographic change has been primarily projected onto the undocumented population of Latinos in the U.S. This is true despite the fact that these trends in demographic change would hold true even if the rate of entry into the U.S. by undocumented migrants was to be stopped completely. The inflammatory rhetoric notwithstanding, the facts of how undocumented immigrants contribute to the U.S. economy are often overlooked or misrepresented. In recent years, anti-immigrant sentiments, particularly those aimed at undocumented workers and families, have given rise to hundreds of local ordinances prohibiting access to housing, education, and jobs. And since Arizona successfully uh, passed statewide legislation in 2010, we've seen many states strive to follow a trend that has been mostly limited to small communities. Amidst this climate, efforts to reform outdated immigration policies have stalled at the federal level as the country has become polarized and paralyzed by competing perspectives on the benefits and liabilities of immigrant workers to the U.S. economy and culture. As chair of the Chicano Studies Department, I have had unique opportunities and a responsibility to be a resource of information and a facilitator of people's understanding of this emerging population. And I say emerging, which I will talk to you about that. In my alliances and friendships with new immigrants and engagement with the broader public, concern about the impact of immigration on, this, on the state's well-being, I've gained new insights and appreciation for the complexities and harsh realities that influence immigrants' decisions to leave home and risk life in El Norte. I also have witnessed firsthand the impact of what it's like to be considered a problem, an unwelcome presence, even though workers and industries that depend on immigrant labor thrive in a mutually beneficial relationship. Further, despite the pervasive media portrayal of the strong anti-immigrant movement and the intensification of rhetoric by politicians, I've seen how immigrant families often forge very strong intercultural community relationships at work and in their personal lives. In the fall of 2006, as I began conceptualizing the project on immigration and the short and long-term impact of the emergence of Latinos as the nation's largest ethnic minority, I asked myself, what can possibly shed new light on the immigration question and the changing demography of the U.S.? Issues that are both uniting the Latino community and making us individual and collective targets of bigots, nativists, and everyday folks who think of all of us as outsiders without regard for facts about when, how, or why we came to be here. What information and whose voices are missing from the increasingly hostile debates about immigration and national identity that surround us? How can we interrupt the incessant media hype and sensation that pits us versus them? These questions loomed large as I thought of how I might help reframe the immigration discussion, immigration discussion. I reached the conclusion that the best way to really explore this problem was to travel across the country and see firsthand the impact of new uh, immigrations, to speak firsthand to the folks within and outside of the Latino community about what their presence in any given location has meant, and to listen and learn lessons from their experience as a means of broadening and deepening our perspective. As I planned my approach, I could not ignore the role the media and its pundits play in shaping public perceptions of Latinos in the national imaginary. As an avid consumer of media, I often feel inundated by the negative coverage of Latinos in crime, our portrayal as illegals, as interlopers, as a cultural and economic threat to be regulated and micromanaged by laws writ large and small. All of these concerns strike many Latinos as absurd when one considers that our existence in the Americas predates the existence of the U.S. either as indigenous people or settlers, even as we also share status with most Americans as multi-generational immigrants. For better or worse, we embody the history of the Americas, including the U.S., which continues to sort of arrogantly proclaim itself as America as a bold act of effacement of its intercontinental neighbors. The complex, conquest, commingling, and contradictions that comprise uh, this identity form the core of Latinos' historical experience as transnational migrants. What is lost on so many people is that the upsurge of immigration across the southern border throughout the entire 20th century is a direct result of U.S. policies that have actively recruited immigrant workers into the labor force and intervened repeatedly in the economic and political self-determination of Latin American countries, policies and practices that continue to this day. In other words, we're here because you, or the U.S. was there. In other words, Latinoization is not a phenomenon that occurs with the United States as a passive actor. Rather, it's a consequence of the interconnectedness of imperialism and globalization, processes in which the U.S. plays a central role and is a primary beneficiary. Immigration policy, then, is at the nexus of the domestic and foreign policy. From J July 1st uh, to, through December 19, 2007, I traveled approximately 8,500 miles through 34 states around the perimeter of the United States on a bicycle to explore our America. While my means of travel was non-traditional, 
for a scholarly research, my decision to travel this way ensured that I could go off the beaten path to meet people in small towns I would not have met if I traveled by other means. It had this and many other benefits, including the acquisition of new insights in, on the complexity of the social landscape and a renewed respect for the natural environment that immigrants traverse and toil within. My trip was characterized by hundreds of chance meetings and introductions by friends via phone or email to immigrant rights advocates in various regions of the country. I conducted more than 75 formal interviews and held countless formal conversations with people. This year I have two books coming out with UT Press uh, based on this project. The remainder of my talk today will focus on the insights gleaned from the interviews that comprise conversations are across our America. Many of the interviews in this collection exemplify what Victor Zuniga and Ruben Hernandez Leon uh, highlight in their important anthology, New Destinations, Mexican Immigration in the United States, which focuses on the novel geography of diverse receiving contexts, where each context has its own racial hierarchy, history of inter-ethnic relations, and ways of incorporating immigrant workers and their families. These stories from the front lines of the immigration debate complicate and often contradict the vitriolic discourse of anti-immigrant pundits, politicians, and voices that inundate new media forms. So what I want to do now is uh, give some background before I start talking about my trip in particular. And one of the first things I want to remind everybody is, we often forget about this, is historically that immigration is the source of tension in this country. It has been for, for more than 100 years. And uh, the earlier presentation today, I mentioned uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's always also been racialized. And there's also always been debate about who belongs, who doesn't belong, what is the cultural and linguistic characteristics of Americans, even though we also at the same time love to proclaim ourselves an immigrant nation. I think we have these, con these contradictions. And so these uh, sh short little uh, uh, characters and uh, historical documents show is that there is, has been, even amongst these Europeans, debates about who belongs. Do the Irish belong? Do the uh, Italians belong? Do the Germans belong? There, there have long been uh, English-only efforts uh, way before they were talking about Spanish, but actually many people had fears that Germany was going to be the dominant language. So Ben Franklin, uh, other people here in the history within Minnesota are striving to pass uh, English-only laws uh, for fear that Germany would take over as the dominant language. So again, when it comes to talking about uh, Latinos, I guess I'd like to, as I stressed already a little bit, is keep in mind the history of the Latin American U.S. relationships, which are, uh, what are the root causes for sustained immigration throughout the 20th century, the push-pull factors of our own domestic policies, our foreign policy as it relates to Latin America, and then the ongoing impact of the uh, immigration of Latinos to the U.S. I won't go into great detail here, but just remind you that if you look at the uh, history of immigration, the history of colonialism in, in the U.S., you would, you would begin to see some patterns here. And if I just jump to the early part of the 20th century, it's important to understand that, uh, again, the Mexican Revolution was a pivotal uh, moment for almost a million people of Mexican descent to come to the United States because they were fleeing uh, the Civil War. On the other hand, it's important to understand that went hand in hand with the Industrial Revolution here where people were actively recruited. This is where we first see people coming up to the upper Midwest to work in the railroad industry, the agriculture industry, uh, the communications industry, and the, so that the development of the U.S. as a superpower in the Industrial Revolution was, you know, foreign workers were key to that. And, but then you also had these sort of contradictions that we continue to see today, these cycles in which immigration and our economic situation go hand in hand. So that when we had the Great Depression, you all of a sudden had a desire to get rid of these folks who had helped build the country, and you had deportations. You saw the same thing in the aftermath of, uh, there was a great economic boom in the aftermath of World War II, where there was the need to have uh, develop a Bracero program is to get mainly uh, migrant farm workers, but also railroad workers uh, in the middle of World War II because there was a shortage of male labor in this country, so they called and actively recruited uh, and developed a program to bring in Mexican uh, temporary workers. And then that program lasted, instead of just being a few years throughout the war, through 1964 because we were going through an economic boom and we wanted those folks here as a source of cheap labor. But even in the midst of that, you had another deportation era. So again, there is this cycle. And, and it's not, uh, it should surprise no one that in our current economic crisis, there's also an intensification of the rhetoric against immigrants. Uh, again, I just want to point this out, though, because it, so what happens so often is that people think that Latinos are all new, or all new immigrants, that we somehow just arrived in the last 20 or so years. Now, much of this, to some extent, not entirely at all, uh, it may be true in places that have not had large populations of Latinos, such as some parts of the Midwest, some parts of the Northeast. But even this is changing. So there is this common view of Latinos as immigrants who've only recently come, 
But it's important to understand that Mexicans had a strong presence here since the end of the U.S.-Mexican War in 1848. Puerto Ricans were incorporated officially into the country as citizens in 1920s in the Jones Act. Why is that important? Because many people don't think of Puerto Ricans, I mean, uh, wrongfully think of Puerto Ricans as immigrants, and they're not. They're internal migrants because they are members of this country as a commonwealth of the nation. Cuban Dominicans became, uh, started, came in larger numbers in the 1950s and 60s due to our relationship with these countries during times of their uh, social uh, upheaval. So they came as refugees. And certainly Central Americans in the 70s and 80s, because and why do we grant refugee status? Because we, have to, we bear responsibility for, the, for being in uh, Central America and supporting re oppressive regimes there that cause the conditions to make people flee and for their, for their uh, both for their very lives, for their human rights, and for their economic well-being. And then you start seeing a large influx of South Americans in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, again, this will give you this, I'm going to go over these pretty quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about them, but they're basic 2010 census data. Look, you can see the large number of the growth, the rapid growth of Latinos voting in the United States. In 1980, sitting at about 14 and a half million, to 2010, sitting at 50 and a half million. That is a rapid increase. By no doubt. Uh, you can see the percent. In 1980, Latinos were 6.4% of the population. In 2010, they're 16.3. So this is a significant increase. Uh, this will give you some sense of the overall percent change. And you see, uh, again, in the, in the Northeast, sort of uh, the 100% of the population change in the Northeast was due to Latino growth. In the Midwest, 60% of all uh, uh, demographic change as a result of Latinos uh, coming in, but they were 50 percent. They were about 50 percent of the newcomers. Uh, again, you can look at the rest of it and you see major change. So that 55 percent of the population change in the U.S. from 2000 to 2010 as a result of Latinos. In the Midwest, Latinos sort of have the largest proportion of Latinos throughout the country, about about 7 percent. Uh, again, some major, uh, some what, some highlights. Three and a half times the increase between 1980 and 2010. Uh, more than about 44 percent of persons added to the U.S. population in those 30 years were Latino, and they were designated the largest minority group in 2003. So we are this country is changing. There's important reasons for this. Some of this is immigration, but it's not all immigration. Uh, again, we're going to be living in a different world, and it's important to understand this. Nearly one in five Americans will be an immigrant in 2050, compared with one in eight in 2005. By 2025, the immigrant, a share of the population will surpass the peak during the last great wave of immigration a century ago. Uh, the Latinos will triple in size in terms of the proportion of the population, and they'll make up 29% of the population in 2050, compared to 14% in 2005. Uh, and by 2050, this will be a majority minority country, and many people have actually pushed that day slightly forward. Uh, but here's partly the reason it's not about simply immigration. It's a tell, I mean, we just compare sort of the uh, whites and Latinos and look at the birth and uh, death rate. You know, there's about 21 million births of Latinos in that, uh, in that census period with, compared to 18 million deaths. For Latinos, are approximately 9 million births, you know, about, only about 1 million deaths. So it's kind of a 8 or 9 to 1 ratio here of birth and death. That accounts for significant change. Uh, so this you know, has major implications for widening the, of the gap, the growth uh, rates between Latinos and whites in the near future. This image here gives you a sense of where most of this change is occurring in the country. And this time around, it was a very different picture for the 2000 census. The 2010 census shows us what? That most of that change is happening in the South. And so what does this mean? It has major implications for the culture and uh, racial understanding of people in the South, which used to have a very binary, sort of black-white framework for understanding uh, group relations. Now, of course, uh, South Dakota is one of these areas that also significant, uh, experienced major change. Uh, again, uh, this will just give you some sense of what's happening here in Minnesota. In 1980, there were approximately 32,000 Latinos. Now, it's about 250,000. This will give you just another little portion of growth, and you see, again, same rapid growth experience in Minnesota as well. Uh, this is just, I always found this picture very insightful as I looked at this number here. Look at the diversity, and again, I wonder about the anxiety in places like Minnesota that, that are fairly homogenous. I mean, there's always been some diversity here, and I know that the Latino population goes back to the beginning of the 
between the century, of course, we have a strong native population, but not necessarily uh, a steady presence, but not necessarily large numbers compared. But if you look at the diversity of Minnesota in 1960, you're talking about approximately 2%. I mean, it's not, a, it's a pretty homogenous, culturally and racially homogenous state. Uh, and so now, in 2009, it's up about 17% of about 800,000 people. Uh, this will give you a sense of the, the population by racial and ethnic group over, over a few year period. Uh, again, I want to talk a little bit about the, the labor trends because this is important too, is that the labor force comprised of native born workers is shrinking, the demand for services and resources is expanding, and employers are looking for workers at both ends of the spectrum, meaning you need low wage workers, even as many people have decided like generationally, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about this, that they want and need a, a, a higher education to be more socially and economically mobile. And that's understandable, uh, especially in rural parts of the country. Uh, it's very important to understand what's driving that. And again, what are the trends? Well, the, here's what I often refer to as many people, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the anti-American discourse simply says, you know, absolutely, you know, Amnesty, let's send everybody back home, let's deport everybody. And, uh, but I think for one thing, I think many people don't realize our country's dependence on this work because a lot of this work is what we might call invisible labor. People work. Uh, primary, the, the niches are construction, restaurants, food, vegetable preserving, and food management, landscaping, travel accommodation. A lot of behind the scenes work that we often, I think, take for granted. Uh, again, in Minnesota particularly, you get a sense that, of how that corresponds, which is very closely to this, this need for the number of new jobs and uh, over time that will be needed in these areas. And a lot of them are the same kind of work. Look for, it's often low wage work. Uh, Again, despite all this, it's important to also understand that with a uh, new uh, emerging group also comes emerging economic power. And this will give you some sense of the size of this that's expected to grow by 50% from 2010 to 2015 uh, and will equal more than 10% of the U.S. total buying power. Uh, again, one out of seven, right now, approximately one out of seven Americans are Latinos. There's still a geographic concentration. And what do I mean by that? Well, historically, you had Mexicans in the southwest, uh, Cubans in the, in the southeast in the Florida area, Puerto Ricans in the, uh, in the northeast in the New York area, and maybe some mixture of Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in the in Chicago area. Uh, so to some extent, that's still true, but it's also changing because now there's much more dispersal throughout the country. Uh, the Latino community does have a high number of uh, recently arrived immigrants. And it's also true that with this uh, recently arrived immigrant, you know, they do tend to come here because they have not been able, they've been struggling to survive in their own home communities. And so they do over, uh, lower the overall average income of the Latino community in the education level. So what's important to understand is that Latinos do integrate both culturally. And by all measures, they seek education. They understand that uh, English is the language of success, despite the fact that many people fear that uh, Spanish language will dominate. Uh, new immigrants know that in order to succeed in this country, you need to speak English. And what has happened is that Many of the support services that used to be in place for helping people make the transition to English no longer exist. Uh, so there's a growing, also Latino middle class. It's important to keep in mind. Now I mentioned just talk about language, but uh, the other measure is again, if marriage is any sign of people getting along, there's a, if Latinos have the second highest rate other than Asian Pacific Islanders of intercultural marriage because there's a, there's a high rate of that. Uh, there's also a lot of entrepreneurship. And again, I point to places like, I don't know about, I know St. Cloud that well, but in, in Minneapolis, for instance, we can point to two or three places that were once uh, sort of experiencing economic decline, geographic places that are now booming because of Latino entrepreneurs coming over and starting their businesses. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit and shift now and talk about um, my first book that's coming out this May. That the other book, but the first book is really the collection of interviews, and I train them and organize them, and this is sort of the organizing principle I use to identify certain themes. I wasn't able to include everybody, I had to be selected. And these are the ones I saw that were people were really talking about. Uh, you know, the whole thing about, you know, about how home is no longer home, how they had to change, this emerging sense of mutuality, which I think is very, very important. Uh, nevertheless, ongoing threats to the community, the need to assert uh, civil uh, and human rights, you know, internal migrations, that is people who are just moving one side of the country to the other, not coming from outside of the country. And, uh, and then just life along the border, because that has changed very drastically along with the immigration debates. Uh, and again, when I spoke to people, I'm not a social scientist. I was really 
I'm, I'm a literary critic, and so I'm interested in people's stories. How do they represent themselves? How do they understand? How do they narrate their own lives? And so I, I didn't go about doing surveys. What I did was actually say, you know, everybody comes from somewhere else. I mean, where did you come from? Uh, you know, and how did your family get here? And how long have y'all been here? I didn't assume everybody's a new immigrant. And I was not only talking to immigrants or only to Latinos. I talked to people across different communities to find out how they're experiencing this change, which I felt needs to be part of the conversation. Uh, you know, so how's, how are things different than they were in the past? Is it, you know, is there any legitimate fears for this fear of a, a clash of cultures? You know, what have been the benefits and challenges to local communities? And to new to immigrants, I would ask, you know, when you have regrets, have there been benefits to this? Has it actually worked out for you? And I want to share some of the observations I had uh, as a, just as a way to give you, again, bring the human side of this, because one of the things that I've noticed over the years, as uh, I think Steve mentioned, even, is that many immigrant communities will say, you know, we just want you to know who we are to humanize us, because all this, uh, again, rhetoric oftentimes dehumanizes people. And to call somebody an illegal alien is really to make them some kind of out otherworldly being that you don't have to consider as anybody equivalent to you. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, these themes. And one of the, one of the observations I made is that this notion of culture adaptation and exchange is ongoing and not unidirectional because people talk about this fear of change. I was in Cottage Grove, Oregon. Slept there overnight, went to some all-American all diner early one morning, and, uh, okay, I'm gonna have to move along very quick. Uh, and I, I stopped at this uh, little cafe, had breakfast, saw that they had this insert of the Mexican uh, menu for breakfast. And I asked the waiter after eight, I said, so does that mean there's changing? He said, oh yeah, go that way, you'll find out. I'm riding along, I see this uh, mural of the Virgen Guadalupe, which is a, a very important icon in the, really the Americas, you know, in Latino America. And so I went inside and talked to them and find out that the owner is not Latino, in fact, at all, but he's, he's white. And what I learned the story of is that in his relationship with the local Latino community, he has gone to have a very difficult life, and he learned from them uh, that this is a sort of patron saint that you could appeal to to help you, to help support you, and help you grow. And he did this as a way, a testimony to what they did for him. Uh, again, I'll move along to a second observation, is that it's important of understanding uh, people from, you know, why people left their homeland, and what, how they came to be here, and, and what their life has been about. This is particular with a particular uh, excerpt of a uh, conversation I had with, with the woman who heads up an uh, immigrant rights organization in Eugene, Oregon as well. And she told me about coming in the 1950s as part of the Bracero program. Uh, but she also tells me a story of when she uh, was in her early 20s. She, she married an Anglo-American that moved up to Eugene, Oregon. And she was asked to go uh, do a translation at an event held by the Quaker community there. And it turned out to be a Central American Solidarity uh, a meeting that was talking about trying to stop the U.S. from intervening in Central America. And so it, it, through this act of translation, her life really transformed, and she became somebody who was very interested in looking at U.S. foreign policy, and she became a very strong human rights activist. Uh, again, I'm not going to play this particular video, but this is a, uh, uh, what I learned from this young man is the importance of his own father. His father came here and received amnesty during uh, 1986, because he'd been here many years working, and how uh, what that allowed him to do was to go on the market and find better wages. And because before he sort of had to stay put where there was a large population so he could sort of be in the shadows and hide. But once he sort of received status, he was able to go seek a better wage somewhere. And that helped me understand the geographic, the new geography of Latino immigration to some extent. Uh, okay, again, I'm gonna talk, get to talk some about uh, Minnesota locally here. But this is something over and over that I found is that there's a lot more going on locally uh, there was a sense that, there, you know, yes, things are changing, and yes, they're hard, and yes, there's some contradictions, and yes, there's some anxiety. But there is this recognition that uh, of dependency. And for instance, I'll talk in a second about Melrose, Minnesota. I mean, in Minnesota, I spoke with people in Worthington, in sort of uh, uh, Melrose, Albany, uh, Cold Spring, Long Prairie, you know, communities uh, down in uh, Rochester, certainly in the Minneapolis area. And I learned, even just locally, things that I would also learn across the country. And that is that much of the work that's being done, if you think about it, in the agriculture industry, in the dairy industries, in the meat packing industry, you know, it's done by immigrant workers. And, and here's why I understand it, because a lot of times the rhetoric says, this is happening because they're taking our jobs. Here's the reality, and from the ground level of our herd of people, is that 
for instance, in Melrose, the story was people no longer wanted to do the very noble work, and, no, and there's no doubt about this, all kinds of work has needed to be as long as it's honest work, right? And, but people, it's very hard work, and it has limits in terms of your social mobility. You're gonna make nine, 10, 11 dollars an hour, something like that. But people are moving to, to uh, St. Cloud, or, or, or commuting, saying, I want to go to school, I want a better job, I want a more white collar job, I don't want to do this difficult work and not be socially mobile, and have access to be able to buy new goods and things. So they were no longer making, they were opting out of doing the generational work that their parents had done, and turning the places like Melrose into what we call bedroom communities. They might still live there, but they drive into, into St. Cloud or something. And so we had this paradox going on, where new they, businesses and politicians make a choice that we're gonna, in order to keep our economy alive, we can't have uh, Jenny O leading town. We can't have you know, uh, somebody else uh, deciding to leave because our town will just die. And so they began to actively recruit people to come and work. And so you have this paradox of a new generation of immigrants, in a way, sustaining the lifestyle of a, a retired workforce that would worked in that same industry. And that was a very important recognition for me. Uh, again, I, this, I met this one couple, Peg, John and Peggy Stockton, and John Stockton recently passed away this last year. But they talked, they moved specifically from Nebraska to Minnesota as when they retired because they wanted to be mediators to help make transition, uh, help new immigrants transition because they had done work in Latin America when they were younger. Now, their own children were not necessarily supportive of their, their pro immigrant uh, stance, but they talked about this. It's like, well, we know from having spent a lot of time with these folks that they're good people at heart, that they work hard, that they're, uh, you know, they have to strong, in their case, you know, Catholics. I mean, there's so many things. It's like, well, you know, if our children get uncomfortable with it, that's just too bad. We're gonna, because this is something very important to us. These people were well respected in Melrose as uh, people who started the English Language Center, who began to help found an organization that put, uh, let new immigrants and older residents talk together. Uh, again, spoke with the police chief there, and he told me too about, uh, again, basically the one who told me the story about uh, Jenny O meeting new workers. He also said, you know, yes, there's cultural misunderstandings, there's confusion, there's anxiety, especially sometimes with the older folks who don't know how to understand, for instance, different cultural ways. You know, an example he gives me here is, you know, oh, they're either killing a pig in the backyard and going to, you know, cook it. And he's like, well, how's that any different, you know, during hunting season, we, we have deers in our backyard and we, you know, gut it and skin it and cook it, you know, as well. And so it's partly, he says, you know, we just have to play the role. That was for me a very important lesson is, uh, this is just sort of a continuation of that one, but about the role leadership plays. What are you talking about? Police, teachers, politicians, lawyers, you know, people with power in communities make a difference on whether the community is going to be open-minded and sort of say, we're going to mediate change in a positive and smooth way, or we're going to clamp down and buckle down and sort of see it as us versus them and fight this. And over and over in other parts of the country, for instance, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, Carpentersville, Illinois, so many other places, uh, you see this debates going on where, uh, you know, what is our stance going to be? For instance, I think it's Lionel Lakes here in Minnesota, recently, last year, passed an English-only law, which I thought was fascinating because they never even had a single request for any translation. But they felt like they wanted to jump on the bandwagon of preparing in case anybody asked for translation. Uh, again, uh, these places like Carpentersville, Illinois, Hazel, Pennsylvania became sort of the birthplaces for these local anti-immigrant ordinances against uh, housing, against rental housing, against education, against jobs. And what happened is that, well, they are having uh, court battles, and many of these have been struck down. The other reality is, is that both of these com uh, communities have experienced major economic downturn because those anti-immigrant ordinances, anti ordinances worked, and people left. And then uh, you, you, know, you find in the papers, I was following this stuff in the papers all the time, where people in Hazel are saying, well, yes, it worked, we did a great job, but now we have to figure out how to take it back, how to change the law back and let, ask them to come back because we're suffering uh, so, so bad economically as a result of having had success. Uh, again, other communities you know, display their support for the immigrant heritage in different ways. Uh, again, in the larger cities, and I'm going to try and move through this very quickly so we can get to some questions, but in the larger cities, uh, it's maybe about, not about immigration, it's about gentrification. It's about the need to figure out how to maintain cultural cohesion in the midst of gentrification and other threats to the Latino community. Along the border, Latino communities are really being challenged by the building of the border wall and, and the kind of uh, anti-Latino discourse that has raised, the kind of increase in uh, 
and immigration enforcement, which has really in intensified. And again, this uh, lawyer for Prop for Immigrant Rights Project down in the south in the Texas, South Texas border told me about how yes, y'all have the raids up in the factories up there, but here you know they're going house to house. Can you imagine the phone calls we get in the middle of the night when they're banging on somebody's door? He goes, it's all because you know. In his mind, yes, they're trying to enforce what they perceive as the law, but they're trying to do it through intimidation and they're doing it in illegal ways and just telling people to let them in when they don't have to let them in and all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, there's contradictions. On one hand, all this anti-Latino rhetoric, anti-immigrant rhetoric has racialized Latinos more strongly than ever. But on the other, so in some ways that's created uh, a more unified Latino community, but there's a, still a stronger sense that we're these sort of perpetual outsiders who constantly have to prove ourselves and why we belong here. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave you with a quote from this guy, but I'm not going to play his quote. He, he does talk about the ambivalence, but this is a gentleman who runs a, uh, a basically a Bracero program in El Paso, right along the border. His office is right across the street from Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Everybody knows that 100% of the people that use this center, or, you know, uh, except for the few U.S citizen workers there is undocumented. But they leave them alone because they never bother us because they know that we feed the local economy. It's the workers who come here from across the border to pick the chilies, to pick the corn, to pick the crops, and they never bother us. They might pass us somebody away from the center, but here is the safe house, not because we have to defend it or declare it or call it a sanctuary, because the politicians, the business owners, you know, would uh, would raise hell if they actually tried to enforce it at this center because this is this absolute dependency on this labor. Now he told me something else, and a lot of immigrants, and there's a lesson I learned along the way too, is that a lot of immigrant rights organizations, especially, well, really everywhere, they have to do work uh, to make sure that uh, that immigrant communities have access to law enforcement, so they're not totally exploited or taken advantage of. And some of that work is specifically around domestic violence because women and women are very vulnerable if they cannot go to the police and they're experiencing domestic violence. So they'll do a lot of domestic violence education work and they work with the police departments to say, you know, they need to be able to call you and know that they can call you so that they're not going to be turned into ICE if they call you for help when they're experiencing abuse. And Carlos Marantes told me this, he said, he said, you know, that, uh, that, there's an analogy between made between domestic violence and immigration policy. Because in my opinion, you know, it, uh, our immigration policy is like a case of domestic violence. Because again, you have to know, keep in mind, that in a domestic violence situation, um, uh, you know, usually it's a man. A man does not beat a woman because he wants her to leave. He beats her because he wants her to stay. He wants her to stay under his conditions. He wants her to stay under his control. He wants to manipulate and exploit her and have her live in fear. Because and that's what we do in our immigration policy, is that we're not really wanting to get rid of people. We, we can't afford to actually get rid of them. We're trying to control, manipulate, and exploit them to the max. And that really was sort of so true to me that I found a very haunting way to think of it. Um, okay, I see that I'm running out of time, and I want to go ahead and uh, just open it up to see if you have any comments or questions. And obviously, I didn't be able to touch upon every area. These will just be some pictures from the background. studies minor and I'm just kind of curious as to what are some of the jobs or opportunities available when I graduate to help yeah well I think if you, uh, there's different ways to think about jobs right I think being a child studies minor is like a wonderful thing right the love to sort of learn and expand your sense of uh, community and belonging and all that I think you know you mean job like career wise but we always tell our minor we have a, actually a, a, our majors and minors and we have something on our website that I refer you to, sort of what, what you can do with the Chicago Studies major. Kind of the same thing in terms of doing work with the Latino community, working in a nonprofit, going on to graduate school, work, doing policy work. I mean, there's just a, there really is a lot of different options because here's the, here's the other, the bigger reality is that any bachelor's degree, you know, will only get you so far. And the rest is about how you present yourself, articulate what are your interests, and I would always encourage everybody to do work they want to do. There's that kind of notion of work, which is very important to have a job, right? But then there's the work of being a, an ally, being a social justice ally, you know, in terms of, so there's always that kind of work, which is, you know, encouraging you to keep doing probably the same thing that drove you to become a minor. 
Anyone else? Thoughts? Is that a question? No. Okay. Oh, Steve. Okay. Um, especially given the, the, the last person you're talking about, that the central trabajador, the, the worker center that uh, you described something along the lines of a Rosero like uh, almost program and a theme that's been running through some of the speeches at the conference has been that this uh, immigration reform which leaves immigrants coming up from Mexico and Latin America as guest workers as the alternative to what we have now, detentions, whether it's the Obama form of silent detentions or the more you know, uh, in your face kind of police style uh, tactics of the Bush administration that both parties seem to be pushing this guest role for the immigrants as the so-called alternative. And there's been a lot of criticism of that, and I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. That was my first question. The second question was, um, this is a difficult question, a difficult topic sometimes to get Americans to talk about, honestly. And so I'm just kind of curious what kind of strategy you used to, to, you know, as you were doing your, your ride through America to get people to open up to you. Yeah, and again, I'll just, uh, just sort of starting a little bit with the second question, and then I'll try and answer the first one first, but come back to that. But it's part of a larger context is, uh, you know, I left with this idea, and again, there's so many aspects of the story that I can't tell in a short presentation, but um, with the idea that I was just going to be, you know, I wasn't going to be on the road to challenge people, I wasn't going to be on the be in your face, I wasn't going to be there to listen. And my goal was really to sort of try and talk to people from all walks of life, pro-immigrant, anti-immigrant, indifferent. And uh, the reality was, I found, you know, because I also was trying to be honest with who I was and what my motivation was and what I was doing, even though I was trying not to, like, be confrontational. Uh, but nevertheless, I really didn't have that many conversations with anti immigrants or people who were just, like, dead set again. I, I, I did have more conversations with people who, were, like, had mixed feelings about it. And this is the little clip from Carlos Menendez I didn't play, is him talking about, you know, most people, Reasonable people are in the middle. I mean, most people are in the middle. You know, there's this whole group of really, really uh, passionate pro-immigrants and a really big group of passionate anti-immigrants. And they rule the stage and the discourse, and that's why it comes across in the news in such a polarized way. Is just, to be honest with you, I think most people are in the middle, is what he says. And some people will listen. It doesn't mean they're not listening or they don't care at all. But they'll they listen to anti-immigrants and they'll say, that's a convincing argument. They're doing all these things. They listen to the pro-immigrants, they're like, oh yeah, I find a connection with what they're saying. And so they have this ambivalence, and he says, this is why we can't act, we don't move. Nothing actually happens. It's because there are people, the, 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 there's a lot of ambivalence about what's right and what's wrong here, both economically, politically, morally, all these sort of things. Um, uh, to get to your first question, there's, you know, I, I did an interview with Flock, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee of, of uh, the, this particular office was in Dudley, North Carolina. And they talk a lot about, they are the largest users of H1, a guest thesis for farm workers. And because they need it there. People just people really don't want to do this work. And that's a big piece of the puzzle here is that it's backbreaking work. If you know anything about farm workers, hear me, some basic facts you should know. Farm workers live an average life of 55. Most of us in this country live over 75, you know, because that work is, exposes them to toxins, it's brutal and backbreaking work. I mean, you, they have, tend to have a lower, much lower degree of education, their quality of life suffers in so many ways. More than 90% of all farm work, hand-picked farm work in this country is done by Latinos. 60-something percent of those are, are temporary guest workers, whether legal or undocumented. So it's important to understand that our, our food system actually depends on this work. And that's part of the answer to me, is to ask people, it's like, I mean, there's a, there's a great article in, um, oh gosh, I can't remember if it's Time or National Geographic, but about focusing on um, an Alabama farmer. You can, I've seen this, this same article in one version of it for the last 10 years. California, I, mean, I witnessed it. I, I witnessed literally my trip, root, fruit rotting in the fields because there are enough people there that hire the ones to do that work. This particular article is a great example of the strong efforts to try and take up people who are saying they're taking our jobs. They put out the advertisement, they said, people, please come in places with super high rates of unemployment. Sometimes people would actually show up and try and do it, and they'd quit for the end of the day. You know, and it's not work that you want to do, which is not to say that I think Latinos are, are brutals and should be made to do brutal you know, work and exploited and take advantage of and be exposed to poison. I mean, I think that worker justice is worker justice for, you know, should be international. That's what Flock does, is actually try and, and unionize people before they even come over to understand that they need to work in 
uh, safe and just conditions. And so I think that internationally, we need to be talking about raising the standard of living for all workers, you know, all workers who are exposed to difficult, unsafe work, and that we should try to eliminate those conditions. Uh, but on the other hand, people need to understand that we are dependent in ways that we don't always realize. And what I've found, and again, it's easy to sort of abstractly talk about these issues when you don't have information, but I, I sort of, as an educator, maybe it's my own naivete, I sort of have this belief that if people have information, if they have you know, reliable information, or if they meet people, that you know, information trumps ignorance. You know, and that there's a lot of educational work to do help you, so that people can have a genuine, authentic debate. People, we ought to be able to have a debate without it being personalized to the point of people you know, screaming and yelling. You're not really having a debate or a discussion. You're just having uh, you know, some kind of verbal shouting match. So I think there's partly this need for education and information. Uh, partly it's this whole issue of, it may well be the case that we need to be thinking about what is the realistic solution for our temporary guest worker program for our immigration. Uh, you know, many, Europe, Europe has a much greater uh, fluid system of people moving in and out of different countries, but they have a way of documenting those folks. I'm not against knowing who's here. I think, I think that's not a bad problem at all. But I also think two things. One, we should be in dialogue with the other nations that are involved. For instance, we've never had bilateral discussions on resolving the immigration problem in Mexico. What does that look like? Do you think Mexico really, really wants all those people to come here? No, it's, it's, it's also uh, uh, controversial in Mexico that they can't and, and don't sustain a, a quality of life for people to stay there. So what are the solutions? Why don't we look at it as, you know, really sit down and negotiate, uh, identify, you know, really permanent solutions? When you were talking about um, the need for certain employers and people who want to do some jobs and um, Mexicans or Latinos uh, open in certain industries, um, one phenomenon that I see around this area is um, that shift from labor um, that, is com that is coming in the folk industry, for specifically in some other meatpacking industries. The shift of labor that has, what we found a solution, especially in this area where we have an, an, an influx of refugees. So I, I have seen a temporary solution. Okay, we don't have to have these undocumented people anymore. We can have people that have legal status, and they're rapidly shifting towards uh, having more Somalis, more specifically, and more other refugees. And then other challenges come. But how is this? How how is this into the conversation? How how can we talk about all these phenomena? I don't know that there are um, pieces that don't fit together. I, mean, I think that there. You know, again, um, I mean, Somali, Somali meat plant, meat packing, uh, factory workers, you know, struggle to acclimate. They struggle to get treated fairly. They struggle. I mean, there's those issues as well. And those are worker justice issues. So I don't think it's either or, or it's a, certainly shouldn't be seen as a competition between the two groups. And I think that again, at some level, there is a logic. Uh, I'll only go so far that there is a logic to the notion of. Uh, the market, well, we are a capitalist economy, the marketplace does regulate the supply and demand, you know, and if there's unmet need in the labor force, then people do what they need to do to recruit more workers. I mean, again, I learned in Novos, talk to people who've been there, they, you know, they told me stories of being actively, they were actually received, you know, uh, extra compensation for recruiting more workers to come. So it doesn't mean that everybody, that, you know, that, that is, that's not the solution, it's not about solving Mexico's labor problem, it's about filling the American labor need. You know, so if the market is there, they're going to come. So what do we need to do? We need to either fix the conditions of work here so that other people want to stay and continue to do those work, or that we acknowledge that we need those work because we don't, we need uh, foreign workers because we don't want to do the work. And we have to have an honest conversation about that. Instead, when, where you go is straight to the point where you're saying they're stealing, you know, American jobs. When they say American, you are talking about white American. Know? And that's simply not the case because that's, reality doesn't bear that out. Anyone else? Yeah, with the, uh, with the election coming up, do you, oh, I guess, yeah. I've got a pretty loud voice to start. <laughs> yeah, you do. Here we go. I'll just talk about 
I was just wondering if um, the people you have met with and talked with, if they tend to side one way or the other as far as the, you know, it's kind of a bipartisan political system that we have here, and what your thoughts are and how the, the politics play into it. Well, politics have indeed played a role. Last time, uh, you know, sort of, had, uh, Republicans took a very clear, uh, not just a stance, but it was a strategy to galvanize, conserv you know, sort of using the cultural conservative argument that these new immigrants are, you know, are coming in and, you know, using the rhetoric that they're stealing our jobs, they're changing our culture, they're threatening our way of life. They're, you know, it was very clear that they were taking an anti-immigrant stance. I think the Democrats are like, no, we need to approach this in a different way. That doesn't mean they had the most sophisticated way, but it was definitely an alternative. And President Obama received whatever it was, I can't remember what it was, but a large proportion, like 70% of the Latino vote, on his promise that he was going to lead immigration reform. Now, Latinos are very, very upset with him because he wasn't able to do that. And he wasn't able to do that for a couple of reasons. One, I think that Obama, this is just my own political analysis, is tried to appease uh, the Republicans by saying, okay, I'll take up some of the hardline stance. I'll take, I'll enforce, I will, uh, you know, do certain things to show you that I'm willing to meet you halfway and that I need you to pass comprehensive immigration reform. So under Obama, we have had the highest rate of deportation uh, in, in decades. You know, the, I mean, almost, uh, I can't remember what it is, almost a million people a year. I mean, it's, a, it's like 800,000 a year. Uh, that has offended a lot of people because there was no sort of quote unquote uh, compensation on the other side of this, no progress toward true immigration reform. So you had almost an, a pure enforcement only approach uh, with no concessions made by the Republicans. So right now I think the, the Democrats in some ways are, are saying, well, we hope that the Latino community continues to vote for us because we're a better option than the Republicans, but a lot of what it might do is make Latinos not vote. You know, they might be so upset about this uh, because I don't think they have any faith with the kind of rhetoric you saw coming from during the Republican primaries that the Republicans can have any more compassion or any more desire to truly resolve the issue in a way that's pro-Latino. So uh, what you see is the Republican Party now talking about Mitt Romney. It's like, well, he's got to do something with Latinos, so maybe it's going to be Mark Rubio or maybe you know, somebody else. But I don't think Latinos are, are that foolish to think that uh, somebody like Mark Rubio is going to be a good option that's Latino-friendly countrywide. He might be good for Cuban Americans with his certain kind of conservative brand of who he is, but that doesn't represent the vast majority of Latinos in this country. And uh, has Obama shared a plan for uh, workers' rights and for kind of the plight of the uh, worker yeah. here? No, not really. I mean, here's the funny thing. Go back historically to um, to George, when George Bush was president, right before, uh, uh, I guess it was, I'm trying to think, right before 9-1-1, when he first became president, uh, you know, he was all set and trying to have bilateral discussions with, with Mexico on immigration. He was pushing this because as somebody who came from Texas, he sort of knew that, you know, that Mexican workers were good for the economy and that you didn't have to take an anti-Mexican attitude in order to have good relationships. So here, that's a sort of this weird contradiction, is that he was going to be on sort of the cutting edge of how to solve this problem in a different way. But when 9-1-1 happened, it all became about the relationship between immigration and national security got so tied together that he was unable to continue with those talks. So again, I think, I don't think they're foolish, like they've never thought of this idea. I think they feel like the political costs are so hard when it comes time to getting elected, because now, I mean, again, people have talked about this. Now the media, you know, all the different forms of media, one of the things that's made is people are perpetually in a uh, cycle of trying to get reelected. You know? So everything they do all the time, you don't have the kind of like get elected and then settle down and get some work done and then you know, ratchet up again for the new election. That's they're constantly appealing to audiences and trying to please them. Uh, but it, what you wind up is doing is staying in a mode of rhetoric rather than action. So I think the paralysis we see now in our politics is partly just that. Do you, because, uh, do you think because of 9 11, the, uh, um, the focus on like, illegal immigration has intensified? Absolutely. Absolutely, of course. I mean, sure. You know, I mean, there's never been a case 
anybody entering the southern border uh, as a terrorist in this country, okay? Never, and there never been, you know, the kind of, at least in the frame, same framework of, you know, contemporary discussions around terrorism, you know, there certainly had never been a Latino terrorist in that sense. You know, those people were maybe internal, I mean, there have been some cases of like, you know, the guy out of Chicago or things like that, but those are, those are different stories. It's not that we're a threat, you know. So, no, I think it, was, it became an opportunity for people, again, to polarize the country, because sometimes, you know, it's easy to have political gain to sort of create a wedge issue. It's us versus them. And that was a party of Republican strategy last time. It was a wedge, used as a wedge issue. Palenti, Tim Palenti here clearly took it on, taking on all this discussion around uh, immigration rhetoric, and we need to have more homeland security people here, we need to, you know, the threat from the southern border in Minnesota, I mean, really? You know, and no discussion about the Canadian border, so it's clearly it is racialized. I mean, Mendoza for his very inspiring and informative talk and thank you to everybody and that's uh, what a wonderful way to